Hello and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. I'm John Kier and with me as always is my co-host Austin Davidson. It is season <laughs> It is season 1 episode 2 and on Sunday the Pittsburgh Steelers fell to the Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore 21 to 14 dropping the Steelers to 4 and 4. They are now in a first place tie with the Ravens although the Ravens now hold the tiebreaker advantage with the win. And going uh, forward, the Steelers have a game next week against the Dallas Cowboys at home. Looking at the injury report, uh, there were several key injuries uh, after the game. Marquise Pouncey had a thumb injury that caused him to leave early, and Darius Hayward Bay also left the game with a midfoot injury. Looking back after the Tomlin press conference, he mentioned that Ladarius Green had a good week of practice, and there's actually a chance he could play this week. He also mentioned that Bud Dupree could come off the IR hopefully as soon as Wednesday and begin his 21-day process to get back on the roster. Jordan Dangerfield uh, had a groin injury. D'Angelo Williams is also being evaluated for a knee, and Ben may also be limited in practice this week as well. On Wednesday, the injury report had Jordan Dangerfield with a groin injury is not practicing, Darius Hayward Bay with a midfoot, Pouncey with a thumb, and D'Angelo Williams with a knee. Sammy Coates was limited in practice with a finger, and Ben Roethlisberger was a full participant. Uh, looking back into the Tomlin press conference, he mentioned that the blocked punt was really the game-changing play. He said that it really blew things wide open when it came to the game and the way the Steelers called their plays afterwards. The punt block was actually a miscommunication that the coaches blamed on themselves. A lot of people were blaming Sean Davis for what happened on the play. And at this point in time, Mike Tomlin had nothing to say or nothing to really add about the team's road woes that have occurred lately, particularly this year and how the Steelers have struggled on the road. Uh, Some other positive things, he said he felt like Artie Burns played well on defense minus the one long touchdown. Um, And that's pretty much it for this week. Um, Austin, it was just watching the game. The score was 21-14, to but it really felt a lot worse than the actual final score did watching it. What, What were some of your takeaways today? I would have definitely called this a blowout. Even though 21-14, it's within one score, it was 21-0 going into that fourth quarter. That is what you call a blowout. I don't. All the points for the Steelers came in that fourth quarter where everything started to heat up. But let me let me look at the defense right now. All right. So the defense actually had a pretty decent day all in all. Like. Uh, I gave the defensive linemen a, a grade of B, the linebackers a grade of B+, plus, and the defensive backs a grade of C+. Plus. Now, let, let, let me uh, go into that a little bit. We had a, a pass rush, sort of. It, it, was, it was great. Uh, one of my winners of this week is Jalen Harrison. He got two sacks. The man doesn't age. He's, he's like going on – this is probably his last year, more than likely. Uh, and – He's still going strong. He also forced a fumble, but it was sadly recovered by the Ravens. Another key, another winner from this week. I gave it to Shazier, which uh, it was close because I I, I was trying to think of who I wanted to give it to. Shazier came back. I've been a Shazier hater for a little bit. And he was causing a ruckus. He split a sack with Anthony Chiquillo. He also caused the fumble, which was recovered by a Raven. And uh, he just, he played good. He made his tackles. He was doing pretty well. Now, one of the biggest things <laughs> from this loss was special teams play. Special teams was doing okay until uh, the blocks punt. And you might think one of my losers this week is going to be Sean Davis, but I'm not. I'm making the losers the whole coaching staff this week because in a presser earlier today, uh, they said Sean Davis was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. They, uh, our, the Steelers special teams coach didn't take responsibility, but he said Sean Davis was doing 
what he was supposed to, which means there's a fault in what the coach was calling. So I think I don't blame Sean Davis for that play. At first I did. I was really pissed because he just – it looked like he just let him go by. But that was apparently what – What was he's taught to do, yeah. Happen. Right. And uh, the next killer, another – the loser – Losing part of the defense, I, I couldn't blame this on one person because this happened to so many players. The penalties. Let me read you off all the penalties from the second quarter. There was a face mask on Shaquille. There was a uh, illegal hand to the face by Hargrave. Then two penalties, which were coming off of a Ravens punt, a neutral zone infraction, infraction by Shazier, rough, and then roughing the kicker by Shamarco Thomas. Like, this, that allowed the Ravens to... It was 4th and 18, I believe, before that. It allowed them to get a first down over the 50. They were in our territory. Luckily, the defense got another stop, not even allowing a field goal, but it was sloppy. It was sloppy as heck. And it, it was it, it was the downfall of, of the uh, special teams. I didn't also say, but uh, Shamarco Thomas had a really good play earlier in the half on a punt. He stopped the ball at the one. It was, it was a really good play. But anyway, continuing with the penalties, uh... There was a P.I. for eight, eight or so against Artie Burns, which you actually called. You said there would be at least one pass interference call on Artie Burns. You were right. And then there was a 12 men on the field <laughs> for five yards. Like, how is this? There was just so many penalties. That was so many yards and penalties lost. And it's just blo- it's blowing opportunities. Like, losing that fourth and 18, which would have been a – uh, a punt earlier would have gave us more time. That was awful. But also, right before the half, Lawrence Timmons dropped, uh, uh, had a ball bounce off of his hands, which would have stopped the Tucker field goal from happening. It was, it was, it's another, it's another week of blown opportunities and shooting ourselves in the foot. There was a lot, a lot of sloppy play and missed opportunities. But. Uh, it, it, so I will say our rush defense was really, really good. This is where the defensive line got a lot of its points for me, in my opinion. They they really shut down Terrence West and Kenneth Dixon when he was in, which is which was pretty good from what I've seen. I uh, the Steelers haven't been doing really good against running backs this year. No, Just, absolutely. Exactly. Like, they've been allowing a lot of passes to go to receivers. Even in the game against the Bengals, Jeremy Hill and Giovanni Bernard were catching uh, passes out of the backfield and running all over us. It was, it was bad. But this was a really good game where we were able to shut down uh, the uh, Ravens' run game and make them one-dimensional. There's also the uh, – I don't even want to talk about it, but – the last and final play that I think that you know what's coming up, which ruined us. I was waiting for you to get to this one. <laughs> was the Rabona kick. Apparently Boswell was doing it um, perfectly in practice. And, and according to Steelers special teams coach, it would have worked. And I uh, on, retweeted on the Steelers, uh, the Stronger Than Steel podcast account, the video of him doing it at Rice. What, what, and, it, and it did look good, but... He, it was just awful looking in the game. Like, it, that may yeah, have been the worst. That, yeah, that may have been the worst like onside kick attempt I think I've ever seen. It it really really was, and you I, we can't blame the whole game on that because obviously onside kick is hard to recover anyway. But it it was really a <laughs> dream killer when the Steelers were coming back. They got three. I mean, not three, two quick three and outs on, on defense. They stopped the Ravens so fast in the fourth quarter, and it was looking really nicely, and it, it just it really killed everything. Didn't even get a shot. Um, but that's really it for the defense. Uh, I I think we, sh- we can move on to the offense. Well, what do you got on the offense this week? What, who's the winners? Who's the losers? What? What happened? Okay. Well, before I get to that really quickly, I just wanted to touch on a couple things. That 
that kick honestly just summed up the entire day for the Steelers if if you wanted an, any indication of how bad the game went for them. Um, <laughs> and just to touch on what you were talking about with the defense, yeah, they 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 didn't play – they honestly played pretty well, all things considered. Um, yeah, the Ravens aren't a juggernaut offensive team by any means of the imagination or any stretch of the imagination, but the way they played the last month or so, particularly on the road, this was a nice, I guess, moral victory if you want to believe in that. Uh, they actually held the Ravens to 274 yards, even though the Ravens won the time of possession battle. They had an interception, which you called Artie Burns getting his first career interception. Nice that he he actually got his first uh, career interception. It's the first uh, interception for Steelers defensive back this year, too. So you also mentioned oh, yeah. the, the pressure. Yeah, for the first, I was looking at it. I, uh, I remember a couple weeks ago, uh, when we were looking at the game against the Patriots, I had talked about how they had only brought four blitzers like every time. Well, they actually brought the blitz this time, and you know they, the Steelers only had two sacks, but they they did get some pressure on Flacco. That uh, interception was a direct result of that pressure, and the Steelers did a good job on third down defense. Only uh, four of seventeen were the Ravens on third down, and like you mentioned, they really shut down the Ravens' running game. Only fifty yards against the Ravens, who actually, over the past few years, have had a lot of success running the ball. They only average uh, just over a yard and a half per carry. So that was a big step up. Unfortunately, the Steelers' offense was just as inept, if not more. Absolutely. In fact, they were a lot more inept than the Ravens' offense was. I really don't understand. I, I guess I should back up. I really... It's been a theme here for the past few years. We all know the Steelers' record against uh, sub-500 teams under Mike Tomlin, specifically on the road, has not been good, nor has the Steelers in Baltimore, nor has been Ben Roethlisberger coming back in his first game from injuries. Um, in, in previous games of Roethlisberger returning from injury, though, you can make an argument easily that Roethlisberger was asked to do too much in those games. Those games may actually have caused the Steelers' game plan to go in an opposite, kind of the opposite way, where they didn't, where Roethlisberger was healthy enough, but they didn't have him do enough. Um, the Steelers were just getting completely shut down on the ground all game long. Le'Veon Bell had 14 carries for 32 yards, which is a 2.3 average. Take away his 13-yard run, and you know that's it's just not a good day at all. The Steelers were having no movement up front. Uh, the offensive line was just horrible when it came to run blocking. So with the Steelers not being able to move the ball on the ground, they had to throw the ball a lot. And I don't, uh, just nobody really stood out until the end of the game when the Steelers were running no huddle and were in desperation mode trying to come back. That was when Antonio Brown and Eli Rogers st- finally stood out, but it, it was just a whole bunch of nothing all game. Um, I, I have a list of three winners, although they're barely winners, especially one of them. Uh, Antonio Brown finished with seven catches for 85 yards and a touchdown. He was my uh, first winner simply because he actually scored. And, you know, seven receptions for 85 yards isn't normally terrible. Obviously, by his standard, it's not very good. Um, and he just he was struggling to get open all game long because nobody else on the Steelers was stepping up for most of the game. Um, except for Eli Rogers at the end, who is my second star. He finished with six catches for 103 yards. Many of those uh, receptions and yards came when the game was pretty much already in hand. But either in, in any case, it's nice to see someone else producing because, gosh, it's been hard to watch Antonio Brown the last few weeks. He, he clearly hasn't looked like himself, but there's been nobody else to take the load off his shoulders. Um, my third star, and this is... Uh, this is only because there was really nobody else to give the third star to is uh, Le'Veon Bell. Uh, I mentioned his poor uh, rushing stats. Um, I, I, uh, there's really not much to say. He, it, it wasn't all on him. There was really nowhere for him to run, and there wasn't, uh, there wasn't much he could do when he had open space because he really didn't have much. Um, as far as the receiving game he had six catches for 38 yards which is also nothing special you'd like to see him have a little more than that but there was 
it was such a poor offensive game that there was nobody else that I felt like was deserving of that. Um, and then if you want to talk about the three losers, my number one loser is Ben Roethlisberger. Now, the final stats aren't horrible. He, he was 23 of 45 for 264 yards, a TD and a pick. He was only sacked twice, but... He just he didn't look like himself. He was he didn't seem comfortable. He never got into a rhythm with his receivers. The play calling was inconsistent. You know, sometimes they'd run on first, second, and then they'd throw on uh, third and long, or they'd throw on first and then they'd run two more times. I really struggled to understand what the Steelers were trying to do uh, in this game. But he just he, he struggled. He had a tip pass that was intercepted, but he there were several other throws where he just he really struggled uh, making throws that we're used to seeing him make. And something I've noticed lately is that the Ravens didn't run any exotic many exotic plays, at least in coverage. They ran mostly cover two, and he was just struggling with middle zones. So that was something I was concerned about, but. Uh, it's not just him. Jesse James is my second loser. He had two catches for 13 yards. He didn't play a lot of snaps after he had a drop early in the game. He struggled uh, blocking, and honestly, so did all the tight ends. They weren't very good. Three, The three of them, James, yeah. David Johnson, and Xavier Grimble, combined for only four catches on uh, seven targets. So they weren't doing anything particularly great themselves. And my last loser is Alejandro Villanueva, or honestly, you could really go with anyone on the offensive line. True. Wow. True Marquise Pouncey. Honestly, it's true. Marquise Pouncey leaving is a big blow. But the reason I'm going with Villanueva sticking out with the rest of the offensive line is because I think it was like the first drive or it might have been the second drive, like the second play of that drive. Roethlisberger attempts a deep pass to the right side and it's incomplete, but he just gets lit up by Terrell Suggs because uh, Villanueva got off the ball late. He, his reaction sort of indicated to me that he didn't think the ball was going on that count, but everyone else was moving. So that leads me to believe it's on him and Roethlisberger got decked and yeah you can take a hit but he's also hurt and uh, I, I don't know it's just it was so bad they weren't getting any push up front for the running game they weren't blocking very well in the past game I mean it wasn't horrible but it just it was such a lackluster game for everybody uh, so when handing out my grades I gave the quarterbacks you know Ben Roethlisberger I gave him a D I was really hoping to see a little bit more out of him I wasn't expecting a lot to begin with but he was just sloppy uh, the running backs, they gave a C minus. They, they really, they, as I said before, they didn't have much room. There wasn't much they could do. Um, as far as receiving goes, I gave them a D minus because of, I'll say this, Antonio Brown and Eli Rogers saved this uh, position group from getting an F simply because of how they played in the final 10 minutes. But they, they were not getting open at all in the, the first three quarters. And Antonio Brown was the only, he seemed like the only player Roethlisberger was targeting for most of the game. Uh, tight ends, I gave them and the offensive line both Fs. I just touched on the offensive line and the tight ends I touched on a little bit earlier. They just, they weren't good in blocking. They weren't getting open. They weren't making catches. Just overall, a horrible game for the offense. Uh, as a group, they only mustered up 277 total yards and as you mentioned before, the penalties, there were several penalties that that were concerning. And yeah, penalties are concerning in general, but I noticed that a lot of these penalties that Mike Tomlin actually touched on in the press conference were pre-snap penalties, which are something is something that can be really avoided if it's if it's coached correctly, if they're disciplined enough. That's something that's becoming a theme particularly the last few weeks and particularly in these kinds of games where they just haven't been very good and they've been sloppy. The other day, Le'Veon Bell said that even practices are sloppy and it's it's quite concerning. Yeah, it's, it's the halfway point of the year and it's better to have these kind of struggles now than at the end of the year, but it doesn't bode well for a team that has really, other than the first game of the year in Washington, they haven't done anything on the road. All their other losses on the road have been very bad, and the Steelers haven't 
played a very good game, honestly, since the New York Jets game, which was over a month ago. So when looking back at this game, there's a lot to be upset about, but there are some positives, like you mentioned, with the defense. But going forward, there's going to have to be there's going to have to be some changes as far as what the Steelers do when it comes to uh, to preparing. I'm not one to blame coaching when it comes to having a lousy game against the team you should beat, but there, this is a trend now. As many of us know, the Steelers are 5-11 and in their last 16 games against sub-500 teams. It's a theme when you are struggling so much to beat teams that you should beat. I've heard a lot of theories about why this is the case. One that I like to think is the case is that this, the Steelers coaching staff is just so intent on running the game plan that they made that they aren't willing to make adjustments or they aren't willing to make adjustments until it's too late. For instance, when the Steelers went to the no huddle and late in the game, they were trying to get back into the game. That's when they started producing. It wasn't when they kept bashing their heads against the wall and they weren't getting anything done early on. I mean, I don't know. That's just, those are my thoughts on it. Speaking as a disgruntled fan, but uh, what do you think, Austin? that your third loser was not Sammy Coach. Sammy Coach was targeted five times and didn't catch a single ball, including a key touchdown. Like, it was in his hands, and he dropped it. He would have tied the game. And it, it just I, – I, I was surprised that uh, – you. Ch- I, I could see why you did it, but I, I, I really thought Sammy Coach blew it for this game, and I had him doing exactly the opposite. I had him winning it, uh, keeping it close for us. Um, also, I would like to include that just today, Marcus Wheaton was put back on the injury report uh, for a shoulder, which is really, really concerning. That's uh, not good. Because I'm sorry, you could go. Uh, I was just saying that's not good. That's um, that's uh, the same injury he's had all year, and it's clear he hasn't been 100. percent He's only had four catches in like three games, but. That's obviously uh, concerning going forward about his status. And for someone who's in a contract year, this has not been the year he's wanted to have. And uh, on another side note, this isn't good for my fantasy team. <laughs> oh, you had Marcus Sweden? Yeah, but, you know. Oh, man. <laughs> well, it, it's really bad because with Hayward Bay out now, well, I'm assuming Hayward Bay is going to be out, uh, we are down to... Four wide receivers, Antonio Brown, Eli Rogers, Marcus Wheaton, if he plays, and um, Sammy Coates. And the so Coates is hurt, too. Four... Wait, what? I said uh, Coates is hurt, too. I mean, just up and down the receiving core, it's just, it, it doesn't look good. And it's, I mean, I figured the Steelers at the beginning of the year were going to miss Martavis Bryant, but I mean, gosh, they, they need him in a big way right oh, now. Yeah. In NFL news, they're starting to evaluate marijuana use. So that maybe he won't get suspended ever again, even if he does. Yeah. This is good news for both Bell and Brian. I'm seriously, like I, I remember hearing that the testing process, it's like you have to fail three times, I think, before you actually get like suspended. So that means that mm-hmm. you have to fail three times before you get suspended the first time. So how many times do you have to go before you get suspended 10 games and then a whole season? I don't, I don't know. That, let's not get into that right now because we could spend a whole show yeah. on just that. Yeah. Um, besides that, I think the other news is let's go Browns tonight. Uh, people watching them will probably already have an outcome, probably a Ravens win, but we could all hope for a Browns win tonight. <laughs> They said they guaranteed they won't go 0-16. <laughs> yeah, let's just hope that the Browns' first one isn't when the Steelers come to visit them because it just it feels like it could be that kind of year. But It feels fitting. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> but then again, the Steelers are going to be home this week against their uh, old-time rival Dallas Cowboys. A lot of history there. Uh, no, uh, no two teams have faced each other more in Super Bowl history than those two teams. Um, we'll touch, we'll have a preview of this, uh, this upcoming game in, uh, our podcast, uh, this weekend, but just some, uh, quick pointers from the Mike Tomlin press conference. Um, 
obviously the biggest concern is stopping the run because the Cowboys have a fantastic offensive line and they've got two rookies who have performed really well in uh, Dak Prescott and specifically Ezekiel Elliott. The uh, the Steelers def- uh, run game defense or run defense in their last game was pretty good. But one thing I do have to say is that the Ravens were the 28th ranked rushing team and we're going from that to the number one rushing team in football. So while I, I do like to look at the moral victory, if you will, of playing the Ravens well against the run, it's uh, it's a whole nother thing when uh, you're looking at the number one uh, rushing team coming into the coming into Heinz Field. What do you think, Austin? Uh, it's going to be rough, but we'll we'll go more into it next. Uh, the Saturday, so we'll evaluate. We'll see. All right. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Nope. This has been it. All right. Um, thank you for listening today. Um, you can email uh, our show if you have any questions uh, at the. It's stronger than steel podcast at gmail dot com. Please follow us at STS Podcast One on Twitter. We have a Facebook page. Check it out. We have uh, sound. We post our videos on SoundCloud and YouTube. So, please get a chance to check that out. We appreciate all the feedback you would have to offer, and uh, we hope you have a great day, a great night, and uh, we'll see you uh, this weekend. Go Steelers!